we, tonight we have Gary Peluso Verdand, and he, in starting the Center for Religion and Public Life here in Oklahoma through Phillips Theological Seminary, he is bringing together the idea of the role of religion in politics, in public life, in a very different way than we're used to thinking about it. So, Gary, to begin tonight's conversation, and we're going to open it up to questions, and if you're on Zoom, put your questions in the chat. But I'd like to start by asking you just to say a little bit about your theological journey, where kind of where you've come from religiously and, and how you've deconstructed, reconstructed your theology to be the person who you are today. So just a, obviously a short version of a yeah. very long story. Sure, sure. Thanks. And thanks, for uh, Marlon, for hosting this and, and uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, Marlon grew up in the, in the Chicago north suburbs. I grew up in Chicago west suburbs. Uh, and uh, in a very white, uh, rather sheltered little community, Brookfield, where there's a world-famous zoo, uh, yes. and uh, in a, a Methodist church that would be very run-of-the-mill kind of Methodist uh, church, I always had a lot of questions, uh, and uh, couldn't often get those questions fully answered uh, in church. Uh, it was really in college uh, when I had my first Bible course, it was a New Testament course, um, where at the end of the first week or two, I really felt dizzy. And I don't mean that figuratively speaking, I, I really felt dizzy. My head was spinning. Um, I had no idea that there had been these conversations uh, and arguments going on for over 200 years about things like, why are there two Christmas stories? Who knew there were two Christmas stories? I mean, it was, <laughs> don't we all put the, the crush together the same way uh, with uh, everything from Matthew and everything from Luke, except all the bad stuff left out. Um, <laughs> so uh, that was one. And in fact, that opened my eyes. It was, uh, I would say the, that course and then the course in uh, the Old Testament prophets opened my eyes to a very under, different understanding of religion from what I grew up with, where religion was, what I grew up was, was sort of just a, it was part of the whoop and wharf and the culture of being a middle class white American, Protestant, right. uh, Chicago area, we're Protestant or Catholic, uh, right. and, <laughs> and all. So, but that started to take my faith apart in some significant ways. Hmm. Um, when I had a, uh, an experience at Wesley Seminary, where I first went in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and spent a whole semester on Capitol Hill and was called the National Capital Semester for Seminarians. Um, and I got to see all these people of faith doing fascinating things on Capitol Hill, trying to relate faith, trying to relate moral concerns uh, with some really difficult national issues. And this was at a time when we were uh, the Iranian hostage crisis was beginning, and our, our, uh, the, we were always concerned about where the, where the hand was on the nuclear clock and how close to midnight we were. Um, uh, then I would say I, I had a, another major shaping experience once I went to University of Chicago uh, after my, my parish experience, um, which in parish experience is always a humbling always a deconstructing right. mode, right? I don't care how much you learned in school uh, uh, because you're constantly encountering yourself. Um, and uh, I was used to being an A student uh, in school and clearly in some ways in the parish I was getting C's and D's uh, just because you can't control anything in a community the same way you put together a term paper. Right. You can perfect a term paper. Communities are not perfectable. Uh, and University of Chicago experience was uh, what they called is, is uh, the, uh, you know, the acids of modernity uh, was one of the phrases I learned in that freshman year, in the first year in my PhD program, with the acids of modernity, all the ways in which the modern world has, has helped us deconstruct religion without necessarily reconstructing it. Uh, so in other words, it's like, no, religion is just an onion. You peel it into it. It's really psychology. It's really sociology. It's really just the, the, uh, the steam coming off of the engine of, of the economy and all those kinds of things. 
Uh, and uh, then I would say in the last place that I've had a you know, major deconstructive experience was, was probably during the time when I was uh, seminary president. Um, where, uh, you know, where I'm finally the in-charge person, uh, whatever that means in an academic context, uh, of shared governance, uh, and having 26 or so bosses, bosses with the trustees. Um, but the experience of coming up against my limitations again, um, and, and uh, I'd say coterminous with that, um, my own journey at uh, 66 years old now has brought me to a place where uh, I'm questioning a lot of things regarding traditional language that I grew up with uh, that had uh, remained in some way, perhaps rethought, perhaps not, in the various other reconstructions in my life. Um, but at this point, it's, it's, it's as fundamental as when we say God, what do we mean? Mm -hmm. When I say God, what do I mean? If I say I'm going to pray, what exactly am I doing at that point uh, and all? And I'm, I'm, I'm just at a point in my life where I'm questioning those sorts of things. And so I'm, uh, uh, I've, I think I've joined, uh, uh, there's, 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 quite a, there's quite a number of persons who have reached this oasis before me. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been uh, 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 kind of see seeking out some guides from here on. Beautiful. Well, that is great. So as you can tell, uh, Gary is much like all the rest of us on a spiritual journey. And I hope you'll write a lot about this journey and what you're discovering uh, for yourself. Can you tell us kind of as we start now, I just want you all to know we're going to we're going to talk about the relationship of, of Muslims in America, Muslims and, and how Oklahoma's responding. There's a lot, the January 6th of anti-vaxxing, masking, all kinds of conversations about how religion is playing into this and the American story, some of the American myths. So we've got a lot to cover, but I want, I want you to begin by saying a word about your, how you understand the role of religion in politics. Yeah. Because we, a lot of us think, when we think about religion and politics, we think about sort of theocratic-minded, evangelical Christians or others who are trying to make their religion the religion of, of the nation or a national religion. Right. So what does it mean to you? Right, well, well and, first... and, and while you answer, yep. I just want you to know, I'm gonna share on Facebook the link on my Facebook, so I didn't want you to think I was uh, playing with my phone or texting somebody <laughs> while you were talking. I just want to make sure I share that. this so more people can see it. And if you have Facebook on your phone, please do the same and share it uh, to, your, to your page. Sure. Well, I'd like to first, we need to distinguish between we're not talking about church and state, we're talking about religion and politics. Church and state are, are, are institutions. Uh, uh, church and state are are. Uh, are while neither are mentioned just that way in the First Amendment, that's kind of what it's referring to with, right. uh, with the clauses regarding religious freedom uh, and there being no established church. You know, there's no Church of America. Uh, the, the, we haven't declared this as a Christian nation, despite what David Barton and other faux historians say. Uh, this is not a Christian nation. It has been a nation of majority Christians right. up until recently. Um, but... Uh, church and state is not what we're talking about. We're talking about religion and politics, and religion and politics are two elements of culture that, in fact, share some of the same soil and the same pathways because religion and politics both, uh, they both tell stories fundamentally. They, they, have, they tell a story we live in. If you look at the Democratic Party today or the Republican Party today, you see not one story necessarily in each, each of them, but there are stories there. If, you want to, if, if, if I asked you, tell me the Unitarian story, there's a story within that. And if I say, well, tell me how that might differ from a Roman Catholic version of, of faith story, you could tell that there's a fundamental story there. We live in those stories. Those stories then also help us determine who belongs and who doesn't belong mm. and what the criteria for belonging is. And you can see a lot in politics these days, uh, a lot of our debating about who belongs in the nation, who belongs as a true you know, patriot. Right. These are all major questions, and 
Uh, and in the same way that, you know, most congregations and certainly religious faiths have. So what does it mean to belong here? Um, and what are the barriers to those belonging for those who uh, may not know, uh, you know, they could get in or that would say, oh, because you do that, because you believe that, I won't be part of this. Third, those stories also help determine what the moral order is. And moral order, it sounds like a, a, uh, some uh, stick in the mud sort of term, <laughs> but it's something sociologists use when they talk about what's your hierarchy of values? Every story has some higher, you know, kind of helps set a hierarchy of values. This is right, this is wrong. This is what we owe to each other. Um, and even whether that other includes, you know, the rest of the inhabited earth, whether that other includes how we play with other nations, other denominations, other religions, um, uh, what we consider to be right and correct, and what we consider to be wrong and even abominable. Uh, that's moral order. Uh, and then finally, um, that story helps determine uh, what our vision is of what we would be if we were empowered to be all that we could be and what the obstacles are to getting there. Uh, so for Christians in particular, let's say, that, that would be, well, the obstacle is some version of sin, uh, whether that sin is pride, whether that sin is is lack of self-formation, uh, whether that sin is broken relationship, broken covenant. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's the impediment to being the people we should be. So how do you overcome that? And so the, the, the story has, has, says, well, here are the practices, here are the, here are the ways to put yourself into a, a surrender position, you know, to receive Christ or whatever, whatever that would be. I'm sure for uh, in, a, in a Unitarian setting, um, you might say, well, it's, it's missing the mark. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it is self-interest uh, twisted around itself. It is uh, loving the wrong object. Uh, and, and so through um, uh, one's connection and community, uh, through the, what one believes, through reason and the like, one uh, uh, could be led to being more of the person and more of the people that you should be. Well, think about that in terms of politics these days. Hmm. There's impediments uh, that need to be overcome, uh, and here's the way that happens. Now, unfortunately, one of the ways you see how just, just how polarized those politics are, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not that, well, if you, believe, if you believe this about immigration, uh, that's, that's what needs to be overcome is the belief. It's the, who, it's, it's the more identity. If you're a Democrat, you're the impediment. If you're a liberal, you're the impediment. Or if you're a, um, an AOC Democrat, it might be, well, if you're, um, uh, if you're an establishment Democrat, you're the impediment uh, that needs to be overcome. But those basics of we tell stories uh, we, we have an understanding of who belongs and who doesn't. There's a moral order of, of what we owe to each other, and there's an understanding of what the impediments are and how we overcome them. Politics does that. Religion does that. We're going to be intersecting with each other. I don't think there's any way around that. We will intersect. And so when somebody says, well, I don't bring my religion into, the, uh, into my public life, I still want to say, um, I want to watch a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there's often, not often, there's always an implied moral order. Um, there's, an implied, there's, there's an implied story. There's, there's even an implied theology in what nearly anyone in public life brings out. And so I think it's fair game to know, you know how someone believes. I mean, just one example. I think James Watt, who was uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, interior secretary, he never actually said, uh, because Jesus is coming again, we don't have to worry about the world burning. That wasn't, you know, that was, he, was, he, was, he, that, he was alleged to have said that, but that was actually not the full quote. However, he really did believe that we could open everything up to drilling. We could open everything up to logging because pretty soon Jesus is coming again. Wow. 
There's a theological belief that is forming public policy. Right. That's an extreme example, but it happens all the time. Well, let's go. Let's let's continue this conversation. Yeah. And if we're talking about extreme examples, and we're talking about <laughs> um, who belongs, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the relationship between Muslims and the American democracy. Because, I mean, part of what it sounds like you're saying is because we all tell these different stories, the religions have their stories, and, the, and there's political stories, the, but, but ideally in a multi-religious, multicultural democracy like we have, the political realm is a, a realm in which a lot of these different stories can find some way to come together around right. how we're going to be, what we owe each other, and how we're going to be together. Right, right. So, but Muslims... Since certainly since 9/11, and right now, as Afghanistan, as we're as we've pulled out of Afghanistan, and eight there's 1,600 or 1,800 Afghani refugees coming to Tulsa, mm -hmm. um, or, or to Oklahoma, and about 900 at Tulsa. We've got the head of the Republican Party of Oklahoma saying we don't want these Afghan, we don't want them in Oklahoma, right. and that's clearly a, an anti-Muslim statement right and it, it, and there's more to it too they're also right. uh non-white people potentially so there's a racial implication a religious implication to this but we're talking religion primarily at the moment let's talk about this relationship between what is what are the barriers to to muslims having a full uh place in the american democracy and and you know why why would you say it's playing out the way that it's playing out right now right right well it's complex right uh, because we religions not only, uh, I mean, I wish we'd spend a little more time trying to find common ground. We, we clearly are spending a lot of time also in, in engaged in conflict. Um, and especially, I think, in a, in a state like Oklahoma, uh, where the dominant forms of religion are Christian and the dominant Christian forms are either um, fundamentalist or um, Pentecostal. Um, and I realize there's variety in all of this, and it's not, I don't want to paint with one brush. Uh, this is a matter of affinities between kind of segments within each of these faith communities. Um, uh, Christianity has never made its peace with democracy. Mm -hmm. Say more about that. Um, uh, there's nothing inherent, inherent in Christianity that would say, uh, democracy is the logical conclusion for how human beings ought to govern themselves. Um, if it were true, if that were true, then it would have been, uh, then, then, then maybe we wouldn't have had uh, uh, Constantine in the fourth century, and maybe we wouldn't have had all of these Christian empires and republics uh, in the East and the West uh, up from the time of Constantine up until. Uh, the founding of the American uh, of, of the United States, and even there in the United States, you know that First Amendment didn't apply to all the states. Uh, finally, until when was it Massachusetts or whatever in like eighteen twenty something or eighteen thirty something? Finally, so, so what you're saying is that Christianity has been it was very comfortable with empire and and monarchy, right, for most of its history, right, right. Um, founder of my, uh, my denomination, John Wesley, uh, uh, got Methodists in this country tarred and feathered uh, during the revolution because Wesley believed that uh, he, was in, he, was in, he was like old style believer, like a real old timer as far as the divine right of kings. And, and uh, uh, when, he, when, when he gave his care package, uh, sent his care package and his emissary over to start the American church to actually split off from Anglicanism, um, Wesley, in his, in his letter, said, re referred to um, uh, us as that land that God has so strangely set free. Because <laughs> he couldn't, he couldn't, couldn't figure how, 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 this, how this works. Um, so... I think we've had our issues with, uh, with uh, Christians have had their issues with democracy. Um, I also think when you look at the, the colonies, they have very different understandings of, of what democracy meant. You know, Athenian democracy was based on a, a, 
uh, a limited number of, of men who could vote. Um, women were to be kept in the private sphere, not the public sphere, uh, and it was a slave-based democracy. There were, you know, you look throughout the South, one of the reasons why you have so many Greek names attached to southern cities is because they understood themselves to be a new expression of Greek civilization. Uh, so uh, that Athenian democracy was pretty limited. When you look at the history of American democracy and you think, well, we got this electoral college thing. Uh, 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 we used to, uh, up until what, like 1920-ish, uh, senators were elected by state legislatures uh, not by popular vote, uh, and uh, um, you know when did uh, 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 enslaved people couldn't vote, uh, um, women couldn't vote. First, prop, you know males without property couldn't vote, and then most states changed that over time. Uh, we were ourselves were quite a limited democracy. One could say, certainly up through the Civil War, and then one would say again, certainly up through 1965 with right. the Voting Rights Act. Right. Um, so we've been, a, we call ourselves a democracy, but we ourselves have, have been a very limited democracy. And then all along the way, the kind of Christian uh, stories that have accompanied are well, we're God's chosen nation. Uh, we had a manifest destiny for white people, and this was very explicit, for the, for the Anglo-Saxons to move from coast to coast to bring the true religion, Christianity, and to bring civilization. And they were thought of as coterminous, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. You brought one, you brought the other. Uh, so that's our history. Um, and I think what you therefore see Today, you see a reemergence of, of, of a Christian identity in America with, with, with and it's, it's, not, it's not coincidental, at a time when uh, a few years back the country uh, fell under 50% Protestant for the very first time in its history. Um, the um, uh, number of persons who identify with religious institutions is in, in been significant decline, especially with younger generations. Mm -hmm. uh, and where since 1965, besides the Voting Rights Act, the other thing that changed in 1965 was a very restrictive immigration law that was put in effect in 1924 at another time when we were quite, uh, we, had, we had enough of my relative types and your, some of your relative types coming in. We had enough of Italians, we had enough Turks, we had enough uh, Eastern European Jews uh, and the like. So they, in 1924, they shut the doors and really things didn't reopen until 1965. And when they did, they took off the preference for uh, Northern European countries is fundamentally what was there. And so you've seen, we've really only become this really serious multicultural nation since the, ninth, since the middle of 1960s. And that includes for Muslims. Muslims, of course, have been, been here since George Washington's time minimally. He sent letters to the Muslims and, and, and welcomed them as Americans. Uh, and as we know, there were some persons who were carried here in the middle passage uh, as slaves uh, whose religion was, was Muslim. Uh, uh, so Muslims have been here, around here for a long, long time, I mean, really since, since nearly the founding, certainly longer than my relatives have been here, right. um, but they're not Christians. And so and, and these days, like with what we saw January 6th, right. uh, is just one indication of, of white Christianity and, and Americanism being twisted up together quite tightly um, into an identity that, you know, from a Christian point of view, doesn't much resemble the religion I know, uh, but is being used for nationalistic purposes. So, I mean, this is, I mean, what you're saying, I, I'm even finding myself really uh, taking this in in a new way that since 1965, so for 55 years or so, 
we've had truly a democracy that had allowed women and people of color and others to vo- be able to vote. So we've finally, only for about 55 right. years, this nation has, has actually been a, a democracy in the sense of a, a pluralistic democracy that allows its citizens over 18 to vote. Right. And, and then you're also saying that, that much of the immigration that's come into this country that's been from, not from Europe, right. primarily happened since 1965. Right. So we've become a truly multicultural nation and democracy, really only for about 55 years. Right. So we're young. Right. We're, we're, as long as, and, and, and the story is always a little more complex. Right. Um, because because we, we, we tend, we, I mean, so those of us who have lived um, east of the Mississippi for a good part of our lives tend to kind of have this, what I call Puritan radiation theory, uh, that everything started in Massachusetts and Virginia <laughs> and the colonies and then kind of radiated that way right. rather than, no, you also have to remember, besides, of course, the, the, the hundreds of, of native tribes uh, and nations that were here. Uh, you have to remember Japanese immigration and especially Chinese immigration right. in the 19th century for the building the railroads and the like, and and uh, um, and then the uh, the very fact that um, uh, the Spanish uh, the, the Spanish had had uh, taken uh, a good part of the southwestern land uh, and. Uh, Spanish, Mexican, you know, that mixture that, uh, of, of, of indigenous and, and Spanish heritage persons are also very much a part of the nation's history. Uh, but in terms of our openness, our official openness to immigration uh, in, for modern times, right. really from the 20th century on, uh, we were a, a nor- North, Northern European white preference until 1965. All right. right, right. The other thing I'll say about that, because I, I love this book by um, Levitsky and I can't remember the other author's name. Uh, it's called How Democracies Die. And their argument is, is that uh, from what we know as civility, we were laughing about that earlier, what we know as civility was actually a white gentleman's agreement from the uh, failure or the end of Reconstruction up until the Civil Rights Movement where there were a whole lot of, uh, of what they talked, were going to talk about with each other uh, in this almost all white men's uh, uh, house and senate. Uh, uh, it, was, it was the, the their, their glue was f- fundamentally white Christianity of some sort, white male Christianity of some sort. Uh, and that with the, uh, with the civil rights movements, uh, in the plural, uh, and with the diversification of, of the um, uh, gender and of color uh, in Congress, the, the, uh, and then the flip between, uh, well, Democrats are the party of segregation and Republicans are the party of, of, uh, of civil rights um, uh, and all. Uh, that was around 1965 That's as well. That's exactly. Yeah. I mean, from 65 through the Reagan Revolution, basically, is where you see that happening. Um, so what, what, what happened there is the gentleman's agreement broke down, and we haven't figured out how to work constructively with each other since. That's, huh. that's the argument for how, democracy, and how democracies die. Interesting. So it's, what, you're helping me see why there's this fervor of people, particularly white Protestants who are trying to you know, feel like the country, they need to take back right. the country or whatever right. that, whatever's going on. Right, absolutely, take it back. Huh. So um, let's, talk about, let's talk about this masking and vaccinations and all that kind of thing. I mean, it, I would think Christianity would be, you know, it's a love your neighbor religion. So I would think that, that you would say, hey, let's yeah. wear our masks yeah. and, and care for other people. Let's vaccinate if we can uh, so that we, cause so we don't spread this and kill other people. Like yeah. it seems like the yeah. most Christian, when we think of like, when you talk about, oh, it's very Christian, you know, like you would think that the Christian spirit would be, I love my neighbors. I'm going to do what's right to, to stop the spread of this thing. But there's, but the attitude seems to be among many Christians today, right. uh, at least on the, on the right, right, seems to be, hey, I can do what I want to do. 
-hmm. I've got freedom. My freedom is more important than, you know, whether I end up killing some people because I'm spreading this virus. Right. Help me understand how, <laughs> how people make sense of that. I was going to ask you to help me understand that, actually. <laughs> um, right. So I guess the way I look at it, Marlon, there... There are all kinds of ways to divide people, right? I mean, in terms of just analytical categories. And one of my categories that I've come, I've, I've come to, at least in, in terms of the kind of questions I ask when I'm reading the news and the like, is, is this person so individualistic that they can't even acknowledge there's something called community? Or are they starting with that there's something called a community that I... That I um, um, I, I can't not be a part of. In other words, that uh, one of my, one of my uh, former colleagues used to say uh, that uh, in the beginning was the relationship, uh, that everything is about relationship, hmm. uh, and that this business of, of saying, well, I'm claiming my freedom. Well, you can't claim your, if you're in relationship, you can't claim your freedom without also saying, well, you get it too. Right. And if you're free now, then you get two freedoms, and then you talk about, well, where does my freedom begin and yours end? Uh, and, and what do we, and again, go to, back to that moral order. What do we owe to each other? Um, those who are, who are uh, pushing away from uh, the vaccine, but more particularly even the vaccine, it's pushing away from the mask. Uh, uh, that for me is an expression of extreme individualism which I take to be, um, it's, it's America at its worst. Hmm. Uh, 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 one, can, one can think about our nation as, as well, um, we, we had a revolution. We pushed away from England. For what purpose? Well, I mean, when you read the history, one of the big purposes was so that they wouldn't restrict us from trying to take the land from the Indian peoples who lived uh, west of the Alleghenies. Hmm. You know, so the push west was a huge part, in fact, of, of the revolution, hmm. uh, of, of the, uh, one of the economic and, and the building up pressure to you know, more and more people that uh, needed land and want property uh, and all that kind of stuff. But if pushed away, then, then what did you have? You had, you had states. You had all these states who got together enough to push away. What brings us together? Well, I got a constitution. Uh, is how, how, how weak or, or, or strong is that constitution when it comes to the federal government? Well, that's been an argument now for the 200 plus years of the constitutions. Yeah, we fought a civil war. Over it. Uh, fought a civil war over it, but and we're fighting another war. We're, we're fighting another uncivilish uh, sort of war over that right now. Uh, and we're hearing states' rights again, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that we probably haven't heard it this strongly since the 1960s. Right. Uh, so I think this is it's fundamentally: Are you wired to understand? Are you wired? Is your moral compass? Is your moral system? is your basic story that, to take a phrase that was used at the start of the pandemic, that we are all in this together. Right. Or is the basic story that, you know what, this country means is that nobody can tell me what to do, which to me sounds extremely adolescent. Right. So, and I think we have religions that feed those. Very individualistic forms of religion uh, that where community is almost not important, other than maybe uh, your own your own particular congregation, but uh, uh, other forms of religion for for which we know that we need strong communities in order to form strong persons. If we want strong individuals, you need strong communities. That for me is a fundamental insight out of religion that I think ought to play into the politics we want to see. It even plays into the state budget we ought to have. Right. Right. Um, but that's not what we see right now. What we see is a whole lot of individualism. And I think, again, that's, that, that is a formula for fracture uh, and uh, not for uh, addressing problems when you have problems as big as things like 
you know, systemic racism or uh, uh, where the planet is turn, seems to be turning against us weather-wise uh, right. because as a species we're changing it in um, uh, negative ways. Right. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, Unitarian Universalism is, is well known for its individualism in the sense of giving people the individual right to, to determine and define their religious, ethical, moral life. But, we, but a critical criteria is we do that within community. And right. so there's this, right. there's always this tension and right. there's this attempted balance right. between what does the individual want and, and what does the community need? And right. so we are a covenanted religion that, that has a covenant with each other, individuals joining yeah. together in covenant, in community. So the community piece is key. I'll tell people, I meet people all the time. They say, oh, I'm, a, I'm a Unitarian. I don't go to church, you know, but if I right. did, I'd go to yours. And I right. consider myself a Unitarian. And I said, but no, actually, you can't be a Unitarian by yourself. Yeah. You have to be in a community because the only way that we can understand how you can freely and yeah. responsibly yeah live your individual religious life is to do so within a community. Right. And that my, my freedom ends where your nose begins. Right. And so we sort of have been working throughout our history to try to balance individualism with, with what it means to be a member of community and what right. we owe each other. So it's an interesting conversation. It is. It is. And I think, again, that's a, that's a conversation that we're... we're um, it, it, there, ought to, there ought to be a way of nationalizing that conversation mm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. because I think we're really, we're really at the point of, well, I don't trust you, you don't trust me. Um, I'm going to flip you off, you're going to flip me off. <laughs> you know? right, right. Uh, and right. and uh, stay in your space because if, you meet, if we meet in our, if, we, if the two of us have to meet in the same space, there's going to be friction. Even know? within the, uh, families and, and, oh, uh, yes. and, and workplaces and churches and all of this, we're, we're even seeing this level of polarization happening that we haven't seen.